Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In this video, probably the next few, I'm going to talk all about the El Nino. So in 2015, 2016, there was a very powerful El Nino. The standard type, the ones that we normally think of where the Eastern Pacific is gets really warm. And this created th this uh, El Nino signal on top of the climate change warming basically pushed us well over 1.5 degrees Celsius above uh, pre-industrial. In fact, we were as high as 1.8 degrees Celsius, approaching the two degree guardrail from the Paris conference during that particular time, 2015, 2016, you know, in specific months, I remember February, March, for example, of, of 2016. So a very fascinating, brilliant paper has just come out talking about that's examined El Ninos for the last 400 years. So instrument records that have measured sea surface uh, temperature anomalies during, during in the Pacific, you know, um, over a long period of time have been compared to records from the, the Del 18 proxy in uh, corals. Um, so basically an oxygen isotope in corals in in so corals you know you get the calcium carbonate there's oxygen in that so if you take the um do an isotopic analysis of the oxygen you can use it as a proxy for temperature and the corals being sampled at 27 different locations around the pacific which gives you a very good idea as to what the ocean temperature was going back 400 years and there's been some very significant results that have been coming out of that the first thing is that the 1997-98 El Nino was probably the most powerful El Nino in over that entire time period, that 400 year time period. The next most powerful was the 1982-83 El Nino. And the third most powerful, only the third most powerful was the 2015-26 El Nino. But of course the, the warming signal has been increasing continuously over that period of time. So most of the damage to the corals and most of the marine heat waves, if you like, that caused severe loss of um, life, of marine life, occurred in the 2015 to 26 El Nino, but it wasn't the most powerful. It was the third most powerful over this 400 um, year time period. The other very significant thing is that these very, very strong El Ninos um, in the Eastern Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, so call it EP, uh, EP events, Eastern Pacific uh, El Nino events. Those are not so common. Basically, there was, there's only about two every 30 years. So they're, they're only about every 15 years. And that matches, it's interesting, if you go from 82 to 98, 2015 you know that's about you know that's only only that's three you know but they're spaced about by about a 15 year um, gap so that's kind of interesting but the other thing is that we're getting a lot more of the central pacific type el ninos um, another name for it is el nino modaki um, is sometimes called. It's where instead of the Eastern Pacific warming off South America, you get the Central Pacific warming. So these El Ninos would only occur, they'd occur about every, um, in, a, in a 30 year time period, there used to be about three and a half of those events. So that'd be about once every nine years for that type of event. And that has increased significantly. The frequency of occurrence of these events has increased significantly um, in the last number of decades, up to about um, nine events every 30 years. So a gap of about, you know, a, a frequency of once every three, three and a half years, something like that. So this is a very significant result because the, the effect on the rest of the planet, the teleconnections from these El Ninos is very, very different for the Eastern Pacific El Nino versus the Central Pacific El Nino. So 
I'm going to talk all about this. The so the other yeah, so it's very very interesting study. Um, it's the longest record, basically, of of this sort of event. So let's go right into the the details here. So, um, so basically, this is my Twitter page. Um, I talked about pyro storms and uh it, it was posted on my blog the the um these pyro storms here these horrifying new wildfire regimes and then here mandy freund is the uh principal author and since this is an australian um group um i thought i'd wear the um uh, australian hat while talking about this uh, okay so let's get right into into it here. So basically, these are the two types of El Ninos. This is the one we're mostly familiar with, the Eastern Pacific El Nino. So the water is very, is very, very warm off of Australia, and that water gets sloshed across the entire Pacific Ocean Basin in like a Kelvin wave. So now it's very, very hot off South America at the equator. This region is much, much warmer than normal, the sea surface temperature. So the hot air rises over there and there's lots of evaporation. So there's lots of rain clouds here. There's rising moist air here. This air um, then circulates back. It's cooler over here now. So it circulates around in this, um, in this uh, circulation. Um, and it's, uh, there's a weakened Walker circulation. The Walker circulation is typically the other way around, but here we get reversal because normally what happens is there's a low pressure area at the surface here. So from the Southern hemisphere, the air comes in to flex left, Northern hemisphere air comes in to flex right. So we get these trade wings, trade winds on the surface blowing the currents this way. So this is, this is a reversal situation when the water sloshes over. This is the strongest type of El Nino. And I'll show you some examples from Earth Null School of the 2015-2016 event. But like I said in the introduction, the most powerful one um, Eastern El Pacific El Nino event occurred in 1998, 1997-1998. Um, it's the most powerful one by far um, in 400 years. Then the next most powerful one was in 1982, 1983. And the third most powerful one was in um, 2015, 2016. And the one in 2015, 2016, on top of, superimposed on top of warming, from climate change warming, global warming, um, has basically damaged huge numbers of coral reefs ar around the planet. The two earlier ones did not cause as much damage because they, although they were stronger events, then they, they, um, they, the underlying climate change signal wasn't, wasn't as high. Now, so these are only happening, I mean, kind of good news is these are only happening about once every 15 years. So we had one in 2015, 2016. So hopefully we don't have another one for a, you know, for a while. What is changing is that we're getting a lot more of these Central Pacific El Nino type events. So in that case, the ocean is warming in the Pacific, mid-Pacific. So instead of the warming occurring off South America and extending out, it's in the mid-Pacific. It's shifted about uh, 100 degrees in longitude to the west. Um, that's about 11,000 kilometers. It's a significant shift. So the warm water here, of course, the air will rise. The rising moist air will occur here. You'll get the clouds here, and then you'll get the, the, the air will move away from this area and then descend. So you get one cell of the walker circulation, and the air will also come this way and descend. So you get the other cell here, and the currents on the surface will be here towards this region and here towards this region. Okay, um, this is also known as a, a dateline El Nino because the international dateline is here. And like I said, El Nino Modaki. Now, these in a 30-year period, 
These used to occur about three and a half times on average, and that's a nine-year recurrence interval, as I said in the introduction, roughly. But now they're occurring much, much more frequently. They're occurring, um, basically now we're getting about nine of these in a 30-year period. So the return period is only about three, three to four years for these type of events. And these are weaker than these events, but this is a shift that we that is believed to be from climate change. Okay, let's look at some other images. So on my Twitter feed, basically, um, you know, my, my pyro stuff has been put on my blog, on my website. You know, David Korn, who does the um, website, has done an excellent job um, of, of putting these videos together. I mean, he's, he's invaluable for me. Um, now, okay, so, so my Twitter feed, um, there's this, uh, you know, there's, there's the, the paper here, which I'll go in into detail, um, but there's some very good images here that I want to show you. So basically, this is an image of the Eastern Pacific type El Nino. So the water warming over here, this is the 2015-2016 the, uh, event. Very, very warm temperatures here. This is going down through the water column. This is uh, 300 meters down to the bottom roughly. So the, you get this very, very large, this is the scale of the warming. So this is two to three degrees is the red. Okay, and you get very, very warm water going deep down. So this water actually formed over here is very hot and it's sloshed across the Pacific Basin, um, which is uh, typical of the standard El Nino event. So there's lots of tweets. You know, El Nino has rapidly become stronger and stranger, according to coral records. Um, some different, lots of different stuff. And there's a video here, which is excellent about the changing pattern of the El Nino. And I think I'll just play this video because it's, uh, so, it's, so, it's done so well. It's a couple minutes. So it's, it's uh, from the Australian Academy of Sciences. Okay, so El Ninos have big impacts globally by teleconnections, and this is talking about some of the impacts that happen in Australia. Like when there's an El Nino drought, when there's a La Nina, the opposite, there's more rainfall and, and cyclones and flooding in Australia. So this is the two types of the El Nino, the Central Pacific El Nino with the circulation like this, and the Eastern Pacific with the circulation like this. So basically warming and rainfall are varying significantly when there's these events. And now there's more intense, the, the Eastern Pacific El Nino events are more intense, but there's not many of them. The Central Pacific one, there's a lot of them. And uh, you know, the patterns have been stable over the last 400 years, but now they're changing. They're changing significantly. Okay, so this doesn't bode well for crops in Australia. Now, of course, as, as coral reefs are dying and no longer growing, we're, we're losing this record of information on them. As a reef gets bleached, you can no longer determine what was, what's been going on. Follow our faith. Okay, so let me close this. Okay, um, so there's data in the paper, which I'm now going to discuss. And also, this is a very excellent Discover uh, magazine article. And I'll talk about that first in the next video. Thanks.